Great to see everyone here today. Uh, welcome to our series, Facing Inequality. I'm James Foster, Director of the Institute for International Economic Policy at the George Washington University. And moderator of today's conversation on inequality and COVID-19. For those of you who've attended a previous IAP event, perhaps on site at the Elliott School before the lockdown, or at one of our recent virtual events, you know you can expect a lively and informative conversation on such topics as the US-Chinese, uh, US-China economic relations, urbanization and poverty, issues in global governance, green finance, digital trade, etc. Of course, at the present time, the conversation has been all about the pandemic affecting us all. Accordingly, on our website at IIEP gw.edu, you'll find a wide range of contributions to COVID-19 policy debates, including a recent conversation with economics colleague and IAP affiliate, Stephen Hamilton, whose work helped to shape the small business policy responses for two countries, the US and Australia. And there's a video of our previous Facing Inequality event with Bronko Milanovic. Now, the general theme of this series is inequality, a topic that underlies many of the big policy questions of the day. Those of us who work in the area marvel at how much the discussion has changed through time. My own dissertation on inequality was considered pretty fringy at the time. But now inequality is mainstream economics, sociology, public health, political science, even computer science, and a host of other disciplines. It was the realization of the shared importance of this theme across many disciplines that brought IIEP affiliate and historian Trevor Jackson. Trevor, are you there? Yes, James, I'm here. Okay, great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Brought Trevor together with economist and IEP affiliate Brian Stewart to initiate this series, which has morphed into the current format. IEP is Proud to host the series with our co-sponsors, the GW Interdisciplinary Inequality Series, and the Departments of History and Economics. Now a few words about today's speakers. Prakash Langani and Jonathan Austri have several identities in common. They're both economists. Both work at the IMF, and they recently wrote a book, Columbia University Press, entitled Confronting Inequality, How Societies Can Choose Inclusive Growth. It views inequality as a hazard for sustainable growth and points out that the actual cost of redistributive policies can be surprisingly low. Prakash Langani is currently Assistant Director and Senior Personnel Manager at the Independent Evaluation Office of the IMF, after many years with the Fund's Research Department. He's no stranger to GW and is affiliated with our research program in forecasting. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins in the Business School. Jonathan Austri is Deputy Director of the Asia and Pacific Department at the IMF and previously led the team that produced the World Economic Outlook. He is also a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Both speakers are prolific authors I would normally expect at least one of you to be traveling at this time. So we are especially fortunate to have you both here for today's event. That's assuming the technical difficulties don't intervene. Immediately following the presentation, we'll hear from two discussants. First will be Remy Jedwab, Associate Professor of Economics and International Affairs at GW, who is internationally known for his work on development economics, urbanization, growth, infrastructure and political economy, but on this occasion will don his economic history hat. His paper, Negative Shocks and Mass Persecutions, Evidence from the Black Plague, was recently published in the Journal of Economic Growth. Our second discussant is Lucia Raffanelli, Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Affairs, who recently joined GW from Princeton as part of the Elliott School's initiative in ethics. Her newest article, Promoting Justice Across Borders, is forthcoming in political studies. 
For more information on our speakers, please see the bios that went out with the invitation. And now for the presentation entitled, Will COVID-19 Raise Inequality? Evidence from Past Epidemics and Crises. Jonathan will begin, followed by Rakash, and you'll have around 35 to 45 minutes. Jonathan. Thank you so much, James, and, and thank you for hosting us. And it, good to see uh, you and your colleagues and the discussants, and now Prakash, too, on the screen. So that's, uh, that's great. And uh, yes, we're not traveling much. Uh, I'm in Cleveland Park, which is about 10 minutes away from the fund. Um, so that's about as far as I go. Um, anyway, it's, it's great to be here. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, I'm going to draw uh, on two sources for the presentation. Um, the first is uh, a paper that uh, Prakash, Davide, uh, Pietro, and I uh, recently published in the COVID Economics Journal, and it's about uh, the lessons um, from past pandemics uh, for the present in terms of uh, the impact on inequality. And the second um, source is, is the book that, uh, that Prakash, Andy Berg, and I uh, published last year, uh, Columbia University Press. Joe Stiglitz wrote the foreword of the book. Um, and the reason we are drawing on that today is that um, we want to be able to try and say something about the medium term. Um, and the medium term is going to be shaped by much more than the current pandemic. So uh, one of the, the points of our book is that um, the rise in inequality since the 1980s um, is due to many, many factors. Uh, and to a large extent, uh, policymakers can shape the future uh, owing to the choices uh, they make in respect of those different factors that shape inequality. And so Prakash is going to talk, drawing on that book, about the issue of whether um, the past, in some sense, is our destiny for the future. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll come to that. Next slide, please. So um, basically, on the first paper, um, we've looked at uh, what has been the impact of major epidemics uh, over the past 20 years or so, um, and also uh, some of the narratives around uh, the, uh, the, the uh, distributional impacts of COVID-19. So we'll talk about, about uh, uh, that uh, just immediately. Um, and then, as I said, we want to get to the issue of whether uh, the past, uh, you know, be, will it be the prologue? Um, and our answer is, um, well, first, about things we will not talk about today. To some degree, uh, the epidemiology is going, to, is going to have an impact on our future. Um, and we do have some, some work on that, uh, but I'm not going to be talking about it today. It's, a, it's another paper in the COVID journal that has our inequality paper. Next slide. Um, but we think that um, what the uh, evolution uh, is likely to be like over the medium term uh, is going to depend on a uh, on a bunch of decisions and political economy factors that we think are very important. So when we ask, uh, will there be an increased appetite to confront inequality? That it indeed is a central question. And of course, we hope that there, there is, and we hope that the, the ideas in our book, which suggest that confronting inequality um, uh, can be a win-win uh, type of policy option, so type of policy choice, in that uh, contrary to sort of the, 
the older paradigm, which many of us learned in graduate school. I myself did my PhD at Chicago, so it was certainly uh, the paradigm when when uh, when my teachers were Bob Lucas and and others uh, that really we should worry about uh, growth than the division much more than about the division of the pie. Our our work suggests that if uh, two things that um, distributional issues will not take care of themselves, so you do need to worry about them. And secondly, worrying about them may actually not only increase equity, but may lead to uh, more sustained and less fragile growth. So we hope that these, uh, these ideas will help shape the policy debates about uh, inequality, which was rising before the pandemic and we think is likely to get worse. Um, the second point we, we want to make, and Prakash will talk more about this, is that uh, there's been a lot of talk about crafting a more inclusive globalization than the one that's characterized uh, the last decades. Uh, and as much as the debate has been about issues of trade and to some extent migration, we think the globalization of finance uh, needs to be part of the discussion uh, of how to craft a more inclusive globalization. So Prakash will talk about some of the work that he and I and Davide uh, Fucheri have done that, that's been published in, in academic journals and is also a chapter of our book um, uh, that argues for, for putting uh, financial globalization uh, squarely at the center of discussions of how to craft a more inclusive globalization. Now, the third issue uh, that we think will, will uh, shape the medium term uh, relates to public debt. Now, uh, there has been uh, unprecedented uh, fiscal stimulus uh, that has been uh, put in place in rich countries uh, to a lesser extent in emerging market countries, given their more limited fiscal space, and even less in lower income countries for reasons of uh, a dearth of fiscal space. Uh, but uh, many people are talking about a day of reckoning uh, when the buildup in public debt is going to need to be addressed uh, through um, either a smaller state or, um, or more taxation, or possibly through uh, more heterodox uh, means. What we want to call attention to is that um, there isn't a one size fits all for dealing with the debt. We would be very cautious about, um, uh, you know, once the pandemic um, is uh, less acute, uh, uh, turning from, you know, a period where of very strong fiscal expansion to one of uh, equally vociferous uh, austerity, that would be very ill-advised uh, because austerity has a, a very clear track record of um, leading to uh, recession and very unequal distributional outcomes. But also we think that successful uh, reductions in debt to GDP ratio, ratios are uh, much more likely if the denominator uh, does the work than if uh, countries uh, deliberately uh, engage in austeri austerity to reduce the numerator. So uh, this is not advice that can be uh, adhered to by all because uh, some countries will find that markets will not give them a long enough leash to, uh, to prevent the need for uh, sharp consolidation. But just because um, the advice cannot be applied to all doesn't mean that it can't be applied to any. Uh, and there will be countries, even after uh, this very 
this great lockdown, this very traumatic event, the most traumatic since the Great Depression, there will be countries that will still retain some fiscal space. And for those, um, uh, allowing the denominator to do uh, more of the work will uh, be a less risky strategy for both economic activity and inequality than aggressive actions on the numerator. And then the, the final issue that I think uh, Prakash will talk about in his, in his part that's drawing on our book is that oftentimes uh, uh, traumatic events such as the one that, uh, that we are all going through and that our economies are going through now uh, lead to uh, kind of an acceleration in technological change. Um, and uh, there are reasons to believe that um, this event might be a catalyst uh, for change um, uh, that would end up uh, uh, increasing uh, inequality. And this is uh, something uh, that we need to be mindful of in terms of its impact on uh, poorer folks and less educated folks, uh, uh, indeed those very folks uh, that are suffering the most in the short term, uh, lest their suffering uh, extend even further into the medium term. Next slide. Um, so to, next slide please, yes. Yeah, so uh, to, to anticipate what we're going to find, um, uh, past uh, pandemics indeed have raised inequality. Uh, Will this time be different? And our attitude, our answer is this time will not be different unless uh, attitudes and policies really change. Uh, and what we are hearing, uh, the encouraging words from some quarters are not just lip service. Um, that globalization is restored with inclusiveness very much at the center. Uh, that public debt is pared back slowly rather than uh, the pandemic be, being followed by knee-jerk austerity, um, and that the uh, gains from automation uh, wind up being uh, more broadly shared, widely shared in society. Next uh, slide, please. Next slide. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm uh, not going to go into uh, great uh, detail uh, on the literature, but, uh, as, as all of you know, um, this crisis has led to just uh, an incredible uh, wave of research. Um, uh, and these are just uh, some of the examples of research on the aggregate rather than dis the distributional effects of uh, pandemics, uh, drawing on, on recent uh, decades, but also with a much more historical uh, bent and I, I know that uh, the discussion that Remy will will uh, talk about will uh, will draw on history, and I, I think that is indeed very very going to be very valuable to to hear his perspective. Um, one thing that's um, uh, not on this slide that is the result of imperfect coordination between Prakash and myself is a related literature on uh, who suffers. Uh, during recessions. It's, it, it, it's in a later slide, but I would also mention it here because um, I do think uh, what we are going through today uh, does share uh, a lot in common with uh, past recessions and the fact that recessions uh, don't affect uh, uh, different income deciles, uh, similarly don't affect uh, different uh, skill levels of the population in terms of the job losses that are experienced um, uh, symmetrically um, uh, and so uh, you know don't affect uh, you know uh, the, the distribution in a in a homogeneous way so um, we'll be we'll be drawing on both of these literatures um, in in uh, in considering the question next next slide please so we are um, we're going to be using uh, you know some sixty years of data, but the pandemics that we are um, 
that we are focused on have all occurred in the last couple decades and they're and they're listed here and our criterion for um for defining our our dummy variable is listed in the in the middle uh, uh bullet um and basically um we are going to uh be tracing out uh the impact on some uh, distributional variables uh, of interest um, using very plain vanilla methodologies. We, we don't want to uh, make the object of discussion uh, methodological, but we of course will welcome methodological comments. But these are, these are uh, the methodologies we apply are uh, very established in the literature and We'll, we'll focus uh, uh, mostly on one, but we'll do some robustness with other methodologies. Uh, so next slide. Um, and these are our data, and uh, I'm sure every participant uh, in this seminar will, will have uh, their own views about, about um, uh, inequality data. And, um, and what I always say, uh, uh, to when I when I have these discussions about people um, casting uh, doubt on on some data sources is that uh, we hear you, but we we uh, make do with what we have, not what we wish we had. Um, and uh, for the country and time coverage that we uh, we are um, looking at. Uh, Salt's uh, SWID data database is um, the most appropriate for our needs. Uh, the other, the other um, sources of data are listed here, so uh, WDIs. Um, and then, when we want to look at, as we as we will, um, uh, you know, job losses in terms of uh, skill level or educational attainment, we will. We will turn again to our best uh, available source, which is the ILO data, and our data will be annual. Next slide, please. Um, and so, as I said, we are um, uh, with uh, sincere appreciation to Oscar Jorda. We are using. Uh, we are going to be estimating impulse responses from local projections, uh, and the left-hand side variable is going to be some distributional variable of interest. It could be the genie, it could be a, an income decile, it could be uh, a share, an employment share uh, based on a, on a skill level. And we will of course have uh, uh, country and uh, time effects on the right hand side. Uh, and our D variable is our, is our pandemic dummy. Uh, and we will have uh, some controls. Now, what are we worried about uh, in controls? Well, we are not really worried about reverse causality because uh, I think we can all agree that pandemics uh, for this purpose are exogenous. But we, we are worried about uh, omitted variable, uh, the, the problem of omitted variables. Uh, and in our baseline, uh, we will have uh, a couple lags of our dependent variable and a couple lags of uh, the pandemic dummy uh, as controls. But uh, in our robustness uh, um, section, we will have uh, a range of other controls. And we were guided uh, in terms of those other controls uh, from work that that we have uh, done in the past, uh, you know, uh, published papers that aim to uncover uh, the most robust empirical determinants of inequality. So uh, things like the level of development, like demographics, uh, like trade and financial globalization, we we think uh, and we think the data support the idea that these are important. Uh, determinants of the evolution of inequality. And uh, so those will be uh, additional controls um, uh, that we will uh, talk about later. Now, 
you know, one of the things when we when we started uh, down this work, uh, and it's amazing. This is only literally just a few weeks ago. Had the idea to do the paper, did the paper, and published the paper. But literally, so. Um, but when we first saw our results, we thought, uh, yeah, we found significant effects, and we were we were delighted. Uh, but we also thought, you know. This this epidemic is much much worse than the than the five epidemics we 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 uh, that are in our sample. So how 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 you know? And so what do we mean by much worse? Well, we mean that the aggregate effects are are much more severe than I'm sure any of us recalls having lived through those those past five episodes in the past couple of decades. And so we wanted a method, and, and we chose one that we used in, in previous studies that, uh, that we've published before, uh, that allows the uh, effect of the pandemic uh, to vary uh, with the state of the economy. Um, uh, and, that's, and that's the second model at the bottom of this slide. Uh, where we have an interaction term with this Z variable, where Z is a measure of the state of the economy, uh, and Z you can think of as basically being GDP. So the idea is that, uh, you know, in very severe states of the economy, uh, where Z tends to minus infinity, um, uh, you might have a very different impact on, on the distributional variable uh, you're looking at. Than, uh, than in benign times uh, where the economy is not really in recession at all. Uh, and indeed, what we will find is, uh, is very much along those lines. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is uh, the first uh, picture of those impulse response functions. Uh, the impulse responses, which is the solid line in, I think, red, uh, and the 90% confidence bands are the shaded uh, areas. And what you uh, see on, uh, on this picture is uh, the evolution of uh, market uh, uh, genie, pre-tax and transfer genies on the uh, left-hand side and the post-tax and transfer uh, genie once the fiscal system has worked its magic on the right-hand side. Um, and zero on the x-axis is the year that the WHO made its declaration. And so we're looking at a five-year uh, horizon. And what you see is um, statistically uh, and economically significant increases in inequality in this five-year horizon. Um, and the most puzzling thing that uh, we uh, that we had in this in this entire project was uh, the fact that the right hand picture is so much more convincing and compelling than the left hand picture, and we we basically thought this surely cannot be right, and we don't ha uh, don't know for sure that it is right. Uh, and we encourage others to look at it. But what it suggests is that uh, notwithstanding the great intentions to, uh, to use the fiscal stimulus uh, to do progressive things and to help the uh, most vulnerable and uh, most affected folks, it actually has turned out rather differently. Um, um, and so this is indeed a perhaps disconcerting uh, uh, aspect of, of these data. Um, we, some of you may have seen um, uh, uh, some of the uh, bipartisan work uh, from the United States uh, that suggests that we cite in our paper that suggests that this might not be completely crazy. Uh, in terms of what actually has transpired. Next slide, please. Um, and 
just to say that we used uh, impulse, we used um, Jorda for our baseline methodology, but there is an equally applicable methodology that was uh, uh, used to great effect by uh, Romer and Romer in the AER about a decade ago uh, to talk about fiscal policy, which is this autoregressive distributed, distributed lag approach. And so we, we use this as a robustness check uh, and find a very similar story. So that's what's pictured here. Next slide. Um, I spoke of uh, additional controls like uh, like the level of development and the uh, demographic factors and uh, trade and financial globalization. Adding those controls uh, does not change the story. That's shown here. Next slide. Um, also, um, uh, you know, some people would think, well, you've you use 60 years of data, uh, but all the action is in the last 20 years. Uh, if you if you reestimate for just the last uh, 20 years, does it change the story? And of course, the the estimates are uh, a little less precise, and there's some attenuation, but the basic story remains the same, as shown here. Next slide. Um, now we come back to this very important issue about uh, is this is this crisis going to be uh, of a similar order of magnitude in terms of its um, uh, inequality effects? And uh, our answer would be no, it's going to be much worse. And the reason is uh, because the impact on GDP is just a much more significant shock. And I think what we see uh, in the augmented model is that, in fact, if aggregate growth uh, following pan a pandemic is not uh, really that affected, um, as we see on the right-hand uh, picture, uh, the inequality uh, effects are likewise uh, much more subdued. But um, when there is a, a, a large uh, adverse effect on the aggregate economy, uh, uh, indeed the poor uh, uh, and so forth, um, who are less educated uh, uh, tend to suffer uh, uh, much more. And the inequality uh, effects that we measure uh, in the impulse response are, uh, are like on the order of 50% larger than the ones uh, we measured in the baseline. Model. Next slide, please. So, uh, of course, uh, people have a love-hate relationship uh, with the genie, and you want to look uh, where possible um, uh, at other measures uh, of distribution. Uh, and I say where possible because, remember, I said at the beginning we used uh, SWID because of its broad coverage. Um, and so when we look at alternative measures, we're going to have a smaller sample, but, but we need to, to look at them. And here are uh, the results where uh, we're, we're looking at a different dependent uh, variable in our, in our Jorda uh, estimations. And we show that the share of the pie going to the top uh, goes up in this five-year horizon following the declaration of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, you see this pretty much on in the top, mostly in the top 10, but also in the top 20 and to some degree in the top 40. Uh, next slide. Um, and the flip side of this is that uh, the shares going, the income shares going to the bottom, uh, they, they started out with much less and they, they are hurt. Uh, uh, much more uh, in the five-year horizon uh, after the pandemic. And you see this in the bottom 10, 20, 40 uh, pictures here. Next slide. You know, the, 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 those pictures, uh, there's a lot behind them. Uh, there's the idea uh, that, um, you know, everyone in this seminar uh, most likely uh, is continuing to get a paycheck uh, by working at home. But um, we all know 
uh, people and we all interact with people who don't have this luxury, um, who actually need uh, to wake up in the morning and probably take some public transportation uh, and get the risk of contracting COVID and actually show up at, uh, at, their, uh, at their job place, which isn't their, their home office. And, um, and there is a connection between your propensity uh, to have to show up uh, at your place of work, which is not your home, and being poor. And this, and this picture gives you a, a flavor of that relationship, which is, which is very strong. Next slide, please. And so, uh, you know, following on that picture, uh, we kind of see much more, uh, much starker differences in terms of your education level, which is a proxy of your skill level. Uh, and we see that for, for folks like uh, everyone in this seminar, um, our jobs uh, seem to be relatively resilient uh, in the aftermath of pandemics. But, um, but the, the people who are on uh, the front lines, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of the people on the front lines, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, your, your supermarket cashier or the, the person who, who cleans the rooms in the hospital or what have you, uh, these people uh, are going to uh, bear a, 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 a disproportionate burden of the job losses. And you, you see that in the last, uh, in the last uh, panel, uh, last section of this picture. Next slide. Um, and, you know, so there are, um, there's plenty of uh, anecdotal evidence uh, and, and actually more than anecdotal evidence, there are rigorous studies using very granular data based on zip codes of people and the income levels and their likelihood of being infected and their likelihood of uh, dying if they are infected and their need to go on a, on a subway or a, or a bus to get to work. And these, these are very corroborative of, of the stories uh, we get from the previous pictures uh, and slides. Next slide. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, and Prakash has done um, uh, some work uh, based not on pandemics, but about, and I alluded to this right at the beginning, uh, about um, you know uh, who who is affected uh, in a recession, uh, and it's not uh, the people on this call. It's uh, it's the people that I talked about uh, in the in the previous uh, slide. And there's there's quite a lot of persuasive literature on this. Next slide. Um, so to summarize this part, pandemics. Uh, over the past few decades have raised inequality and diminished job prospects for low-skilled uh, labor. Um, now, this is a very different, uh, uh, you know, answer than we, we get from, from the historical literature, and I hope Remy is going to talk about it. I think he will. Uh, and Walter Scheidel's famous book, uh, which, which talked about pandemics being the great leveler. Um, and, and the key mechanism there, of course, is that so many people died and so much of labor died and capital labor ratios changed. Uh, and this improved the bargaining power of labor. Uh, and with the improvements in healthcare and medicine, we don't see that today. And I think most of us, all of us would think that's a good thing that we don't see all these death uh, today to the same way we saw it in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, and we wouldn't seriously contemplate uh, those kinds of death rates as a mechanism to improve the bargaining power of labor. So we have to think of other ways. Um, now, will what is our answer? Will COVID-19 increase inequality? Well, our colleagues seem to think so, according to a recent poll. Uh, and the anecdotal evidence I shared uh, is not reassuring. Um, so. Uh, uh, Prakash will tell us whether this time will be different. Uh, over to you, Prakash. Next. So uh, Jonathan laid out the four questions that on which uh, we'll try to provide some 
speculation. I hope it's somewhat informed speculation, but it's based on work we've done for our book. So these are the four questions that on, on which I'll, I'll quickly um, let you know our views based on the on the work we've done. Uh, next slide, please. Next. So uh, on the first question on whether attitudes have changed, um, there's this remarkable editorial in the Financial Times uh, that appeared on April 3rd. Um, and when you read it, uh, you, you sort of feel like, you know, it's as though the Guardian had Zoom bombed uh, an editorial meeting of the FT because it's it's what you normally see in the Guardian. Uh, so I won't read the whole thing, but the FT is saying that we have to reverse the prevailing policy direction of the last four decades. So everything since Reagan Thatcher, uh, they say, has to be reversed. Redistribution has to be on the agenda. Universal basic income and wealth taxes have to be part of the distribute. Uh, have to be part of the discussion. Next slide. And um, many other uh, folks in our society, some very rich people, billionaires, have been saying that uh, we should be doing the right thing. We should be helping the poor. This is a wake up call. So uh, CEO of JP Morgan, hedge fund billionaires uh, are all saying uh, kind of the right things. Next slide. Okay. Uh, all of this is sort of music to our ears because as, as Jonathan said, um, the research that he and Andy Berg did, um, summarized also in our book, shows that um, more inequality uh, leads to less sustained growth. So every dot that you're seeing here on this graph is, is a country. And on the x-axis, you're looking at the Gini coefficient for that country. And on the y-axis, you're looking at how many years that country was in a growth spell. And what this chart is showing you and backed up by lots of econometric analysis beyond this simple correlation is that uh, uh, high levels of income inequality uh, lead to less sustained growth. Next slide. And um, you can control for the many factors that you think should affect the distribution of growth, such as trade openness, the quality of political institutions, FDI, exchange rate competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, even after controlling for all these factors, the surprising thing from the work that Jonathan and colleagues did is that income distribution emerges as something that enters the pantheon of things that influence the duration of, of growth spells. Next slide. On the other hand, a lot of people, as he said, in, in, in the kind of tradition that he and I uh, went to school in, Chicago, uh, Rochester, where I went, which was a farm school of Chicago, um, we were trained to say that, look, re redistribution is, is dangerous. And if you do it, you're just killing the goose that, that lays the golden egg. And what this work shows, uh, which came out in the Journal of Economic Growth and other of Jonathan's papers with Andy is that uh, there really is not much of a relationship between growth and redistribution. You have to get pretty extreme with redistribution to start damaging growth. Uh, next slide. Okay. So to summarize, um, people are saying the right things. Will they do the right things? Um, we are not so sure, but it's, it's a start to be at least saying the right things. Uh, next slide. The second question we address is whether countries will uh, put globalization together, which we think would be a good thing, but we would agitate in favor of putting together a more inclusive globalization. So at the moment, there have been disruptions in global supply chains, uh, flows of capital have collapsed, the EMs are suffering a shock greater than the Great Recession in terms of the uh, pullback in capital flows to them, and of course, of course, uh, flows of labor have come to a, a, a big halt. Next slide. Okay. Now, what kind of uh, globalization should we put together? Uh, Danny Roderick gave a, a very nice talk recently where he laid out the different uh, characteristics of the three major uh, eras of globalization that, you, that we've had, if you will, the gold standard, the Bretton Woods, and what he calls the hyper-globalization of the 1990s and beyond. And a distinctive feature of 
our period, hyperglobalization is free capital mobility and an active role for multilateral institutions such as the one that Jonathan and I, I work for. Uh, next slide. And, and Danny makes a point to which, with which we have quite a lot of sympathy that a retreat from that kind of hyperglobalization would not necessarily be bad. In particular, we feel that uh, there could be less emphasis on financialization and financial globalization. We could uh, have uh, globalization where our sister multilateral institutions such as the ILO and UNCTAD and the World Health Organization going forward could play uh, as big and as prominent a role as the bank and the fund uh, play in international uh, policy discussions and, and deliberations. Next slide. So we would very much like the views of academics and uh, other thinkers on financial globalization to be taken a little more seriously in the policy arena. So there's a whole bunch of studies over the last 20 years, starting with Roderick himself and ending up, as you can see at the top, with Krugman and Gita Gopinath saying financial globalization isn't what it's cracked up to be. Uh, and, you know, people like Martin Wolf in there as well. So, I mean, you just have a whole host of very, very prominent thinkers coming to the conclusion that you have to take a careful look at whether financial globalization is delivering what it what it promises. Uh, next slide. And the puzzle to us, as well as to uh, Arvind Subramaniam and Danny Roderick in this very nice op-ed that they wrote, is that despite the views that I summarized in the previous slide of prominent thinkers, uh, policymakers seem to be uh, retaining their attraction to financial globalization. So um, we have some speculations of why that is the case. Next slide. Now, we, we have done a lot of work. Uh, this is a paper that came out in the JMCB last year and um, where we basically show that financial globalization uh, has very little impact on average incomes. That is shown on the left panel. And but it has a very material impact on income inequality that's shown on the right panel. Of course, I don't have the time to go into the details of each of these estimation, but loosely speaking, this is done using the same kind of Jorda technique that Jonathan showed you for the pandemics. Basically, we isolate episodes and then we look at what happens in the aftermath of these episodes. Next slide, please. Uh, we also find that financial globalization, just as Jonathan showed you for pandemics, raises top income shares. Uh, that's the left panel, and it lowers the labor share of income. That's the right panel. Next slide. So to summarize there, we hope globalization is put back together after the disruptions, but we hope that people take a cold, hard look at financial globalization and see whether it can be restrained in a way that makes globalization more inclusive. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, the countries of the world, to their credit, have given a tremendous amount of fiscal support to their populations in the aftermath of the pandemic. The total uh, the IMF has been counting is now $9 trillion. Uh, and uh, if you look in percent of GDP, it varies quite a bit, but there are countries that have given as much as 20-30% of GDP in support, and even the ones that have not given much are nevertheless giving 3-5%, to 5 okay? So the, the, it's, it's uh, something that is quite significant. Next slide. Uh, but as Jonathan said, it's very important that we do this carefully. Uh, austerity hurts. It leads to decline in incomes and increase in unemployment. Next slide. And very importantly, austerity leads to an increase in income inequality. Next slide. So I think we should be careful about how we design it. Uh, this is a good time to play homage to the really un untimely death of Alberto Alessina. He, he showed us how to design austerity policies in a way that the hurt is minimized. Next slide. And I'll close with this. We'll 
the experience of the pandemic? Will it speed up automation? Next slide. Uh, there's a nice paper by by Brook, uh, in, in Brookings that says that uh, when you have an event of this kind, companies do speed up uh, automation. That could happen this time as well. Next slide. And we have a, a nice chapter in the book based on the work of our colleague Andy Berg showing, as you would expect, that in any reasonably calibrated model, uh, when you have an increase in robot efficiency, it creates a gap between skilled and unskilled workers. Next slide. So let me conclude. Uh, okay. Jonathan showed you that past major epidemics have raised inequality. Will this time be different? Um, he and I are more or less on the same page. I am quite pessimistic because you can see that the answer is no, unless there's a whole bunch of precondition, new attitudes, new policies, globalization being restored with inclusiveness in mind, uh, t keeping in mind the dangers of austerity and making sure that the gains of automation are widely shared. This is a very big list of conditions. And so I think one has to side with the poll of economists that it would be difficult to overturn the course of history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kash. Uh, we're running a few minutes late, so I'll just turn it directly over to Remy Jedweb for the first round of discussion. Remy. Oh, great. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Remy. I'm from uh, GW. I'm an associate professor of economics at uh, ESA and GW. Uh, you can find my research on my website. I have a lot of papers on the Black Death and so on, so these links will be shared with you. All right, so let me talk about the paper I've received. Um, obviously, this is a very important topic, but I'm still trying to understand what I'm learning with that study. And when I think of inequality, there is wealth and there is income. And so here, I don't know if I'm talking about income or wealth. And when you think of inequality as well, you need to think that Income comes from like wages, rents, and dividends. And we know the labor share is around like 50 to 60%. So 50% of the income in the world or like developed countries is coming from like wages, like working directly, or like rents and dividends. And so we don't, in that study, we don't know anything about rents and dividends. So we don't know about like 50% of like wealth inequality. Um, the other thing as well is that if you think of a pandemic, you need to think of a level of mortality. You need to have to think of selective mortality is dying as well. And then you have all these economic disruption effect that um, my colleagues have been talking about. But for me, you know, I will like, I will have written a different paper where I discuss all these different channels and then discuss the constraints. Instead of saying we don't have a data, so we don't even discuss these mechanisms. I, I think the other thing as well that they focus on pandemics, but they're pandemics and pandemics. So, they focus on five different pandemics, mostly like SARS, H1N1, MERS, Ebola, Zika. Um, but the mortality rate of a disease, of a, of a pandemic is gonna depend on contagiousness and what we call the infection fatality rate. And so COVID has a high reproduction number, but has a low in infection fatality rate. And so the death toll has been very high because the passion of the world is very high, but the infection fatality rate is not that high. So my colleagues are right when they say that in the end, not that many people are dying. Uh, if you think of Ebola, Ebola has a much higher infection fatality rate. So like 50% of people who have Ebola die. So Ebola is a very dangerous disease that has very low contagiousness. So that's why death toll was actually relatively low as well. And if you think of like disease where Zika, they call Zika a pandemic, but Zika probably didn't kill less than 200 people. So it's a pandemic just by name. It's not really a pandemic of like, it's not a real pandemic. So I was, I was wondering about like, I know that's the official definition of, of, of the WHO, but what do we learn from Zika in this specific case? What I'm saying this is because of the disease in the past, uh, if you think of Black Death or the 1918 influenza killed more people, but the mechanisms are very different. When a lot of people die, uh, people may inherit properties and the question like who inherits properties and wages go up due to labor scarcity effect. And so who's going to benefit from that? And so I want to show this figure. This is from um, uh, a website by, uh, like a, it's from a website by Guido Alfani. Um, and so this is inequality over like uh, several centuries. 
and so during the black death, so I'm trying to move this thing, uh, okay, it doesn't move. Uh, but during the black death, uh, inequality decreased instead of increase. And why it decreased? Because there were two mechanisms. Uh, the first one that a lot of people died, so there was labor scarcity. So as my colleagues were saying, wages increase. But there was also this thing where because a lot of people died, and people who had actually a lot of land died, the land was partitioned between different people. And so as a result, like non-labor wealth was divided. So here, I think my colleagues have talked about the labor share effect, but they didn't talk so much about like, you know, what happens to like savings and what happens to, you know, wealth and so on. Um, this is a black death. And I think my colleagues are right when they say that um, to some extent, when we think of COVID, uh, it's not like a lot of people die. So this labor scarcity effect may not be realized. But at the same time, when you look at recessions from the past century, recessions tend to decrease inequality. So if you think of uh, 1929 in the Great Depression, inequality decreased according to data by Thomas Piketty. If you think of the war, um, inequality decreased because the wealthy own assets in Europe and then these assets had no value or lower value. And then if you think of Great Recession in 2008, inequality decreased as well. So if you think of the three most important economic events of the 20th century, every time actually inequality has decreased. And here it's not because of labor, but because of capital income. And so I think that my problem with this study is that it's only focusing on labor and not really talking about capital. All right, so yeah, I have some comments on quality, but we're, on a, we're out of time. So I'm probably gonna stop here and uh, let the other discuss some of the paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Remy. And let's move on to Lucia Raffanelli. Lucia? Hi, can everyone hear me? You're on. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, so thank you so much for having me and, and to Prakash and Jonathan for this super interesting and informative talk. Um, I just want to say to start that I think, you know, though some of these predictions are really quite dire, I do think it's very encouraging just to see these issues of inequality really being brought to the fore. Um, so for, you know, for that, I really appreciate this work. Um, I, I'm a political theorist here at GW, as James said before, I'm a, an assistant professor of political science and international affairs. My main research area is ethics and international affairs. Um, so instead of focusing on the sort of history or economic side of things, my comments are going to focus more on the ethics side of things. Um, and so in the short time that I have, what I really want to do is just put a few questions on the table that I think, you know, it will be helpful for us to kind of think about, um, it, you know, perhaps in the background or as framing questions or to keep in mind as we're discussing, um, you know, what are the right sort of ways to react to this situation uh, that, that Prakash and Jonathan have described. And so the first set of issues that I want to bring up relates to their point um, that, you know, how unequal things kind of are and continue to be going into the future is probably going to, to depend, at least in part, on what model of globalization the global economy kind of operates um, uh, operates on. Um, so, you know, will we continue with what they've called this hyper-globalization or will we pursue a more sort of inclusive globalization strategy? Um, and I really do appreciate this point, you know, that we should be thinking about inclusion alongside um, growth, that we should be worried about things like whether people have enough economic resources and opportunities to feel included as members in their own societies, um, you know, whether people with low incomes and low educational uh, outcomes are benefiting from growth as well. I think those are really important considerations. Um, but I think they also raise a couple of questions. So um, one question that I think they raise is sort of how radical a departure um, from the kind of status quo uh, dominant ways of thinking about um, economic institutions and growth would we need um, to actually have a truly inclusive globalization. Um, and just to sort of, you know, frame that question a little bit more, I guess I want to I want to talk about, you know, what um, what Jonathan and Prakash have uh, in, in some of their other work called the, the neoliberal agenda. So this kind of idea that, you know, uh, we should be opening international trade, opening international capital flows in particular and finance flows um, that we should that government should be maintaining low public spending and low public debt. And as they were saying before, perhaps um, kind of introduce austerity policies. And of course, a lot of what, um, what they've said today um, and in their past work has been to sort of critique that agenda, or at least to say that it's not living up to its, its promises. 
Um, and I think one, you know, question that I have going forward is kind of how, again, kind of radical a critique of that agenda do we really want? Um, so one option I think would be to have some sort of small reform, some what you might call friendly amendments to the neoliberal agenda. Um, and another option might be to have a more kind of radical departure from the sort of values that underlie that agenda. And I think that some of the things Prakash and Jonathan have said today and in their past work, you know, might fall on one side of that divide and some might fall on the other side. Um, and so I do just want to kind of push us to think about, um, about that question a, li a little bit more explicitly. Um, so, for example, some of the reforms that they've suggested, um, like, you know, regulations to limit certain kinds of international capital flows, like portfolio investment or debt speculation, um, at least when those things don't clearly encourage growth. Um, and clearly increase volatility, um, or to take another example, sort of tolerating higher levels of, of public debt in certain circumstances where, um, again, that doesn't really threaten economic growth. Those things to some extent might seem like kind of smaller reforms, more of these sort of friendly amendments to the, the neoliberal agenda. Um, and one way to think about that might be uh, to say that, you know, we should kind of pursue economic growth and pursue a lot of the um, overarching goals of, of neoliberal policy, um, but we should sort of temper that pursuit a little bit by these other considerations. Um, whereas if you went for a sort of more radical departure from the values underlying neoliberal policies, um, you might think instead, for example, that we should sort of design our social, political, and economic institutions simply with other values in mind from the start. So we should sort of design them to embody things like fairness, mutual respect, equal concern for well-being, equal opportunity, um, and that, you know, promoting those values or having our institutions embody those values should be our kind of primary goal when designing them. Um, and so I think one way to put this question, you know, do we want a kind of friendly amendment to neoliberalism or do we want a more radical departure, might be to say, you know, should, should growth um, and other sorts of goals associated with the neoliberal um, agenda be our kind of primary, uh, our primary goal? Um, should growth be the constraint on our pursuit of other values? Um, there's other values like sort of fairness or um, equality of opportunity, or should those other values, uh, for example, constrain how we pursue growth? And so that's one question that I think it would just be helpful to sort of hear a little bit more about. Um, okay, and then the other kind of set of issues that I want to highlight um, is really uh, maybe a, a sort of more political question, um, the question of sort of who should get to decide what is going to be done to mitigate these inequalities um, that the talk today has highlighted. Um, and in particular, I think, it, you know, it's really important to be asking how we can ensure that the people who are most disadvantaged by these inequalities, um, you know, whether they're, they're created or exacerbated by COVID or by some other cause, how can we ensure that those people are not excluded from the decision-making processes? Um, so, of course, you know, to put it sort of polemically, one question is, you know, what should be done to address these inequalities or to make sure that they don't get worse? Um, and another question is sort of who gets to decide what is going to be done? Um, and I think, you know, this is this is perhaps especially important um, because, you know, as as everyone's been saying today. The people who seem to have a lot of, you know, influence um, in these policy spaces um, are perhaps not the same people who are suffering the worst effects um, of the pandemic or of other other kinds of inequalities. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's really important to consider: are those people who are suffering the worst worst effects? Um, are their interests being represented? Are their preferences being represented? Um, are they being recognized as sort of people in their own right who can make valid claims about what ought to be done uh, to address the problems that they're facing. You know, is their testimony kind of being taken with the appropriate weight? Um, and in particular, you know, are the people with interests in maintaining more of the sort of status quo institutions that perhaps have created these equalities in the first place, the ones that are going to continue to get, to set the terms of the discussion going forward? And I think that's you know, especially important given today's speaker's desire to say something about, you know, the medium and long-term kind of response, what should be the response to this inequality. Um, and I think, you know, it's really good that, uh, that everyone's been pointing out kind of even the people on this call involved in this discussion right now are not representing the people who are, of course, suffering the worst effects 
um, from the pandemic so uh, or from other other kinds of economic inequality so I do want to sort of push us to think about that that, that as well you know what are the avenues, what are the possible avenues for sort of incorporating the voices of those people um, who are suffering the worst effects into the various decision-making processes? Um, and I think that some of the things, you know, you said today might kind of push us in that direction. So, you know, you, you proposed maybe thinking about including other kinds of international organizations like the ILO in certain kinds of decision decision-making processes about these economic policies. So I think that could that could perhaps be a good start to think about this. Uh, thinking about this issue, uh, but I also, you know, want to make sure that we're sort of thinking about how accessible, you know, even those other kinds of institutions are uh, to people who, again, you know, might be su suffering the sort of worst effects of this, um, this pandemic and these inequalities. Okay, and I think the final um, thing that I want to highlight in the last minute or so is just that I think this discussion has really helped um, sort of uh, maybe bring to the fore an, another another question which uh, kind of runs through a lot of the moral debates that I encounter about, um, you know, economic policy, uh, which is the relationship between sort of um, institutional regulations and individual freedom. Um, and I think that there's, you know, a kind of, um, you, you might call it a naive uh, view that, you know, the more sort of regulations you have, the less freedom you have um, in the economic sphere. Uh, and I think one of the things that the discussion today highlights is that the story is just really not that simple. Um, of course, you know, we see um, we see people who, for example, maybe haven't had the opportunities to gain um, certain kinds of quote unquote high skills um, or haven't had the opportunities to gain certain kinds of education. Now, you know, not having the freedom to sort of pursue their own personal development, their own economic development. Um, and that I think, you know, one of the things you've shown us is that that is not you know simply a result uh, that that is in, in, to some extent a result of, of maybe a, a lack of a, the right kinds of um, sort of uh, regulations or institutional intervention. Um, so I guess with that I will turn it back over to the uh, other panelists and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much Lucia that's great. Um, now it appears that uh, Remy has made a few empirical observations to address and uh, interpretation of results. Lucia's discussed how inclusive is globalization got to be, who decides, obviously getting back to power and freedom. Uh, before we let the discussants have a minute or two apiece to respond, uh, all of you out there who want to have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and proceed. Who would like to speak first of Jonathan and Prakash? Minute, minute and a half. Yeah. Prakash, you go first. Okay, uh, on Remy, um, I think that, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, this research is one month old. Uh, you know, with, with COVID, we are all doing research at warp speed. So, um, you know, this is the best we could do in one month. Um, so, so, yeah, we indeed start with income inequality, but as data permits, we would like to look at other forms of inequality, wealth or consumption inequality, if those data are available and if we can use it. Um, so, uh, and then we do completely agree with you that the mechanisms for the past plagues uh, might have been very different from what's operating now. As Jonathan also mentioned in his remarks, I mean, the previous plagues wiped out huge swaths of the population, and that is not a great way of uh, of uh, raising the bargaining power of labor or raising labor share so so we we do think that the mechanism now is different and we think uh, we don't prove anything in this paper but it has to be that uh, unskilled labor which does not complement uh, capital and robots and automation as well as skilled labor is taking the brunt of the adjustment these days so our sense would be that if we had data on, um, you know, skilled versus unskilled incomes, that this would come through very clearly. Uh, again, in one month, the best we could do for now is to use the education um, attainment as, as a proxy for skills. But we are very much in the search for granular data that would allow us to look more directly at what's happening to wages for skilled and unskilled workers and that would give us the channel that at least we have 
at the back of our mind that we now have two classes of workers in society, those that can complement and work with capital automation and robots and those that are getting displaced. Um, you had uh, a question that we also want to get to the bottom of. I mean, to what extent is, is it the effect of somehow the pandemic itself from the recession that is uh, generated from um, by the pandemic? And I think we would like to do some more experiments to sort that out. We did show you that the impact of the pandemic depends on whether or not there's a big hit to GDP or not. So you saw that in the cases where there isn't much of a hit to GDP, the pandemic does not lead to much inequality. That suggests to me that it's not so much something specific about the pandemic uh, as a health issue, but the fact that there is a loss in output and loss in jobs and loss in people's ability to um, make incomes that is leading to the increase in inequality. And um, finally, I think that you had a point about whether the uh, pandemics could be themselves sort of somewhat endogenous. I think we take that point. I mean, we have been treating them here as purely exogenous, but there may be some endogeneity that, that we should really look into. On Lucia, I will just say that these are excellent points that we are economists and we honestly, at least I don't have a good answer to whether one needs a friendly amendment to the new liberal agenda or a radical departure. Given where we are sitting and who pays our paycheck, we are skating on thin, thin enough ice raising the issues that we have. And I think it's up to political scientists, <laughs> ethicists and others in society to answer the questions that you uh, are asking whether we can kind of tweak this model uh, at, at the margins or whether we need to go back to ground zero and say, what kind of society do we want? What are our values? And we build up. Uh, I think I like what Danny Roderick said, which is that at the very least, you know, we should contemplate if, if in 1948 it was the ILO and the UNCTAD who were in the driving seat, what kind of globalization would we have ended up with? Uh, we've ended up at something different. At the very least, we should bring them onto the table and give them more of a say, and perhaps that gets us moving in the right direction. Okay. But uh, thanks very much for both your comments. I think they were very interesting and very useful. Should I say a few words now? Um, so starting with uh, Remy's comments, um, so I take the point on, on data. Um, what are the right data to be uh, looking at here? Um, are, the, is, are the right data the complement to the data set that we looked at? Is it really the case that uh, the uh, billionaires across the world are really those who um, are suffering the most because uh, their equity holdings have dropped in value and uh, dividends are not flowing uh, the way, uh, the way um, they were in the past. I'm open uh, to that hypothesis, but um, I kind of feel it's more likely uh, that the um, those at the bottom uh, whose jobs have vanished uh, and who have no income, or um, informal workers who make up uh, the vast proportion, the vast majority of labor forces in developing countries uh, where remittances have uh, dropped uh, to uh, by an unprecedented extent. I, I kind of feel at least uh, anecdotally, and also supported by a look at genies of labor income uh, and the job loss data and uh, the income deciles, that um, it's, it's, it's tough for me to, to sort of see that inequality uh, is actually likely, in, in the relevant sense, is likely to be falling uh, as a result of this pandemic. Um, but again, um, we are not um, 
we are not uh, paid to use uh, Fred Soltz data. We don't get a commission from that. So if there are better data that are uh, that are available, we certainly and they and they show the opposite of what we contend uh, is likely in this paper. We would be uh, absolutely delighted to make those findings uh, public. There was one uh, question that I wanted to pick up uh, from the audience, which is uh, why um, the rich are uh, making statements to the Financial Times saying, and why the Financial Times is uh, writing editorials saying uh, the world uh, needs to change radically. You will recall um, the Economist also had an awakening some years ago on this um, on this uh, same issue. My hypothesis is it's basically um, uh, it's the the answer is given uh, by the questioner, uh, Mr. Davuti, in the in the audience, which is uh, the barbarians are at the gate and um, uh, the elites feel uh, quite threatened. Uh, and that that conceivably is uh, uh, is a possible mechanism for change. Uh, you know, picking up on Lucia's um, uh, comments, that basically uh, more access across all the different uh, uh, dimensions, including to the political process, uh, is what one is going to need. Uh, to uh, engender genuine change, I think um, uh, you know whether that's going to happen is 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 very much an open question. Uh, uh, are you going to allow these people in, or uh, once this is over, are you going to try and, and restore the status quo ante? So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, comments from our questions from our audience. Um, Marta Ruig has asked about. The fact that the political coalitions after World War II have dissipated, in particular labor unions, um, the question becomes one of what coalitions should be strengthened in order to perhaps turn this around. And she noted that uh, the overall discussion was a bit negative in the sense that it seemed from discussion till now that not much could be done. I know your book is different. Uh, second, um, Francesca. Francesco Luna wanted to follow up on Lucia's points after redistribution and sometimes pre-distribution. Is there the possibility that the profession goes back to discuss distribution as the classical object of political economy or economics? I'll put those two on the table for our guests. I can I can try. Um, so I mean, on the first one. I think that uh, again, this is obviously speaking personally, not as not for the IMF and not perhaps even for Jonathan. Um, on the coalitions, I mean, I think that in my mind, uh, the center left of is is are the people who should have been protecting uh, the people who have been hurt a lot over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and one slide that I didn't show is that. What we found is that financial globalization is one of the contributors to lower union density. So it's no accident that when you allow free flows of capital across national boundaries that you elevate capital and their bargaining power over labor. And so the union density just doesn't happen out of thin air. It happens because of decisions that were made. So I think that, and, and the people who I think should be protecting uh, workers from all this is traditionally the center left. And I think the co-option of that group by the right and their sort of drift towards, you know, to somewhat protecting the elites is, to my view, uh, a source of the problem. And that's the grouping that needs to somehow find a way to uh, come together again if you're going to change things in, in a meaningful way. Uh, whether this will go to the extent of where, where we will make distribution the central thing uh, in economics rather than growth and growing the pie rather than splitting the pie. I don't know, nor do I know that I would want to go that far. 
I just think that we've grown the pie enough, we are rich enough now as a society in aggregate that some attention to redistribution and even a small amount of redistribution would go a long way in helping some people who are really hurting. Great, Jonathan, are you wanting to comment or should I just? No, I, 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 I think yes. Prakash handled that nicely, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I've noticed the nice discussion of multidimensionality and the uh, inclusivity, if you will. It is crucial that we think of many dimensions. So I'm kind of wanted to highlight that point. And that point in the way we look at many distributional measures, including inequality, poverty, well being. Uh, so I'm thinking that there will be, as time goes on, more and more concentration on these other dimensions, including the ones that the political scientists are quick to point out are so important. Um, I also wanted to just make one other comment, which was that Nora Lustig has talked about the overall fiscal uh, in, uh, incidence of you know, policies and finds very often that what the government intends to do is the opposite of what actually happens, citing the example of Brazil, all the programs, but it has this net negative effect on the poor. So do have a look at that literature. And since we have just reached the witching hour, um, I like to bring it to a close uh, as much on time as possible. But if there's any closing comments that uh, anyone would like to make a quick one too, I'd be happy to let them do it. Just from my side, a big thank you for organizing this. I think this has been a rich discussion, bringing in history, politics, and economics. And uh, I think Jonathan and I both appreciate this opportunity to follow Branko Milanovic in this series. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. This was terrific. Thank you. And Lucia, thank you. And of course, Remy, who has, I know he has thank to you. run off to another event. Yes, thank you. This is great. Great. All right. And that's it from uh, the IAEP, our Facing Inequality series. Goodbye.